Ah, and welcome to Voices of Truth One-on-One -on -one with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation. I'm Ahu Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Windy Lahaina on the island of Maui. And I'll tell you this, we got a great guest on the show today, so let's go on over here and meet him. Kemoku. Aloha. Aloha. Aru. My kai. Good. Kemoku Kapu. Did I say your name right? Yep. Wonderful. And Kemoku, tell us where we are. We're right in the heart of Lahaina Town, known as the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii once upon a time. And right in front, right behind us, we have our center that I manage, Naikane Omaui Cultural Center. And what is this cultural center, Na Naikane Omaui? Omaui. Naikane Omaui Cultural Center is the place where we kind of steer in plans for future generations on how to have the community involved in uh, traditional as well as contemporary management for island resources. Back in the old days, Lahaina used to be the capital of the Hawaiian Kingdom, yeah? Yes. It wasn't Honolulu, it was Lahaina. Yeah. And there's something right around yeah. the bend from us here, right around the corner, that's highly significant about that, yeah? Very highly significant. This area was basically the hub of everything. Uh, Kaui Keoli Kamehameha III wrote the first constitution for the constitution of the Kingdom of Hawaii, right here. Really, right here? In this area. Wow. Yes. And it was known as the Constitution of Kalua Ehu. And interesting enough, Kalua Ehu was named after a fish pond. So the Ali in that time, you know, everything was elemental and spiritual, uh, basically on the fact that uh, a fish pond was to protect the small fish from being eaten from the big fish. So by incorporating those two together on the traditional knowledge versus the contemporary by writing a constitution, is to protect the small fish from being eaten from the big fish on how the constitution was written to protect the native Hawaiian people. So yeah. these two fish, one large and one small, were the symbolism yes. of how the constitution was written. Yes. And the constitution was written by Kaui Keoli back in what, the mid-1800s? 18, 18, around 1832. 1832, okay, good, and so, in this area here, it was written, he wrote it, but a lot of other stuff happened in this area too, yes? I mean, how far back does this area go that we're traveling in right now? Oh, many, many generations, I would say. Um, this whole area, like before, now today they call this Front Street. <laughs> but the old name of the street is actually known as uh, Ka'alaka, Ka'alaka Mo'i, the pathway of the king. Wow. Shaw Street that comes into Front Street, it wasn't that known as Shaw Street, it was known as Kalakamamo, the way of the people. Yeah? So knowing that these names, why these names changed in the past, well, who knows? Maybe the foreigners couldn't pronounce the names right or anything, but what the changes of when a lot of the foreign occupation came to this place, literally what they were trying to do was turn Lahaina into little USA. Uh -huh. So you have Shaw Street, Front Street, you have um, the next street down is called Prison Street. And, you Prison know, Street. Yeah, wow. Prison Street. So all these English names, yeah. the Hawaiian names got wiped out. And they yeah, and Prison Street, the old name for Prison Street was known as Papu. And Papu in Hawaiian uh, means fortress. Yeah, so a lot of changes. Tell us what we're going to be approaching up here that is so significant to the history of not only Maui, but all of Hawaii. We're approaching the area that was very sacred to all, a lot of our people. The area that was known as the direct lineage to the Pi'ilani lines. Yeah. So Pi'ilani was one of the major Ali'is uh, in its pre-contact era, but they are of the Lono dynasty, the Lono lines, the highly priestly lines of Lono was this area. So Pi'ilani was a very high priestly line of Maui, up yes. in, of this area, yes? Yes, all the way back going 1400, 1500s. Wow, that far back. And what was this anciently known as, where we're walking into right now, Kea Moku? Uh, Moku Ula, Moku Ula. So Kuula means altar, yeah, and Mo. So Mo Kuula, Mo 
uh, kind of short hibernation for mo'o. So this was the place of the altar of the lizard. And I always kind of stress that to a lot of people that how did Hawaiians actually know that in the bosom of a woman was formed a little mo'o that had a tail? Yeah, we were scientists. You know, our, our kahunas and our family generations back, we have mo'olelo stories, mo'opuna, grandchild, mo'okuauhau, genealogy. Now we're in the place of the mo'ula, or mo'okuula which is the altar of the lizard. So the word mo'o is very, very prominent in many, many words in the Hawaiian language. Yes. And yes. it has a significant place in the, not only in the language, but in the culture, which is really inseparable. Yeah. Okay, so today this is a parking lot. <laughs> yes, it is. But back in the day in the 1400s, 1500s, all the way up to the 1800s until the whalers came, this was, this right here, this was ground zero, the epicenter yeah. For where the highest chiefs were, yes. where they stayed, and also where the constitution was written. And the kingdom, the Hawaiian kingdom, was run right from here, yes? yes. Uh, on the island of Mokula was where, you know, was the residence of the Ali'i. Across the street in this way was the place known as the Hale Pula which was the house of the iron roof, that's where Kawi Keoli's palace was. And that's another parking lot. Yeah, and that's another parking lot. And throughout the years, we've been trying to beautify it and trying to bring back the historical content of the area. And you know how that goes that when you're dealing with politics. Yeah, yeah. It's easier to put other things in that has nothing to do with our tradition and history, but this part of town, believe it or not, it's uh, designated on the historic district one which means there's remnants in the area that you can actually see that makes, gives it that criteria determination of a historic district one. This little cut here yes. was one of the cuts that they did when they did the archeological inventory survey where they found the actual pathway. So right here where we're standing. Right here where we're standing. Wow. So about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, they did this cut and they did another cut on the other side see where the outline of the island was and they found it right in this area here. The reason why they buried the island was because of mosquito pestilence yeah that the health department back in the early 1900s uh, made a determination that because the waters wasn't flowing into this one big area which is known as Mokuhini a fish pond that the water became stagnant and all it, came, all it became was an uh, area for mosquitoes. So the health department decided, hey, let's bury the island for safety reasons and for health reasons. If you and I were to step into a time machine right now, and it took us back to the 1400s or 1500s, and we landed right here, what would this look like? Describe to us what we would see. You would have sentinels, you would have a lot of people that was very keen and cautious on who came on this island. So I don't think, uh, well, maybe with my status as my bloodline, I would be okay if we were to go back that far back. But then I would have to protect you from being <laughs> slaughtered by a lot of the Kia'i because you're not supposed to be on this part of the island. They would ID me right away. <laughs> I, I would be the first to go. <laughs> Good. But it really, uh, cautious about this area. I mean, there's a lot of literature that talks about that nobody was welcome on this island because of the sacred chief is Keopuolani. Yeah, yeah, they had to be protected because yeah. this was the. I mean, this was the power where where the power was and where the decisions were being made. Yeah, you know. And she was a sacred chief is that her genealogy basically came from a godly like mm -hmm. all the way down to mm -hmm. where she was. She was born in Pokukalo. So up there? It's on the other side of the mountain where Iao is. Uh -huh. So that's Pau Kukalo at uh, Pihanakalani Heiau. She was born there and it was prophesied that she followed the fuel of the sun. She was born in the east and she died in the west and she lays today at Viola Church. Wow, amazing. All right, so Keamoku, what kind of structures would we have seen if we came back here in 1400? They had a lot of kauhale. Uh, like a lot of houses yeah houses within the area you only had about maybe a couple of houses in the area mm -hmm. 
And this area on Mokoula was only done for priestly things. Mm. Yeah? Offerings that were given. Uh, believe it or not, right where the pump house is. This green building over yeah, there. Yeah, this green building. That was known as Kalua Ehu, which was a fish pond. Okay. And in a lot of the literature that you can find in the Bishop Museum, talks about when the Hawaiians came, a lot of the contingency came from all over the state that they offered their gifts or whole kupu to the fish pond because they believed that's where the mo'o was. Wow, the lizard. The lizard goddess. Right now, the archaeological company, which is uh, Cultural Service Hawaii, is done with the uh, AIS, the Archaeological Inventory Survey. And now it's a waiting thing. Once they're finished with that, then you have to go through another process of permitting. And what we hear is the Corps of Engineers, with the partnership with the county, is want to come in and do the full restoration of the project. Really? To make it exactly like it was way back when, huh? Well, we put some, um, how would you say, some safeguards in there. Uh -huh. That they had to stay at least uh, 30 meters away from the original island because we wanted to hand sift the rest, yeah. This town, believe it or not, we have a lot of people that is interested in treasure hunting. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. There's uh, years ago when I used to be the chair of the Hui Ova Kaolua, I used to see guys inside here with metal detectors. No kidding. In the park. No kidding. Because they knew how important this area was, that this area was known as a historical site even in comparison to Machu Picchu. Wow, really? This is a monument that they built when they started the project back then to, you know, kind of remind people that this is a special place, that this place needs to be respected. The plaque that they have here talks about Keopuolani, yeah, what her whole background is and uh, just a pictorial version so people had a lot more respect of there when they came over here because, I mean, look at it. It's a baseball field with a basketball court and a tennis court. So I always, I used to do the Maui Ne walking tour and I used to have like 30 tourists walking with me and I did this for Akoni Akano, a part of the program to start educating a lot of the new people that come to Maui about how special the place is, that it's a baseball field. Well, if you remember the movie, if you build it, they will come, yes. Field of Dreams. Yes. Well, let's take it back another generation or another generation. What was here before the baseball field? So we've been seeing from that time on a lot of the lineal descendants that lived in the mainland, they're coming home and the first place they come is they trigger to this area. Hmm. So kind of similar to Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. They're drawn to this, yes? They're drawn and to it. Do they know why they're drawn here or not? Yeah, because their whole lineage, their whole bloodlines is of this place and it's just that, that inner mana that draws people to this place. Why? Because this was the governance before. This was where, you know, Hawaii and the hospice of yesterday's society and every, every, how everybody found a medium on how we could work together, how we could flourish together. So back then, people actually did work together and flourish together. Yes. So if that's the case, Kimoku, how is it possible that this area that is so important with so much significance can end up being two parking lots a baseball field, and a tennis court. Let's just say commerce has a lot to do with it. Commerce, in other words, commerce. the almighty dollar. Yep, the almighty dollar. Uh, Pioneer Mill, the sugar companies, you know, they basically started the degradation. Back and in the 1800s. Back in the 1800s. Given where we are right now, walking through what used to be Moku'ula, and then I know where we were when we started the show, which was that building over there. Mm -hmm. and tell us about what you do over there and how that is directly connected to what used to happen right here. <laughs> Everything is a strategy nowadays. Um, for like the work that I do as part of the Ahamoku system, the Ahamoku system is an old system of government. Explain yeah? that to us, what it is. The Ahamoku, ah meaning court, Mm -hmm. Yeah, like how you can uh, weave the rope, huh? a rope, like, yeah. like how you can weave like about eight different weaves together to make one aha. Uh -huh. So it's strong. Yeah, so it's strong. So 
in the past, a lot of the kahuna and of, a lot of the ali determined on uh, specific people who had knowledge within the community on how they can infuse all those people together to form this one ah council. Mm. You had uh, navigators, you had celestial navigators, you had uh, fishermen, you had farmers, you had kahuna, uh, kui kui puone, the builders of temples, you had everybody with the uh, scientific knowledge of yesterday bind it into one cord which formed the Ahamoku. It was about making sure that we looked at um, traditional resource management on how tradition was passed on from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. Because within one moku or one community, yeah, you always had one expert or one kupuna that held all the knowledge. They would be the resource of that kupuna. Kupuna. In one Ahupua, you may have like maybe about a dozen kupuna in those areas that was keen to understanding land management, ocean management, all these things of the past. Mm -hmm. And my job today as the CEO for Ahamoku Maui is bringing those values back today and how we can get a lot of our elders involved. Today's, uh, this morning's meeting was getting the next generations to step up to step up to the plate on how they want to be involved in the process on being advisors to give recommendations to the state and county on projects that are pending today and how we can implement things of the past in the projects that they get pending on how it could benefit not just well, the county or the state during the project, but the general community at large. Wow, so Kiyomoku, if I understand what you're saying, it's the same, you're doing the same thing today that they did back many, many years ago, right over here where we were, yeah? yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. You're keeping it alive because the old ways work. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I think what is really is important, we no longer have our fish ponds. Mm -hmm. So, Mokuhinia, which surrounded the island of Mokuula, was a viable fish pond. It was a resource that fed the nations. We don't have that anymore. So the first thing that the state, as well as the federal government, is worried about is like the depletion of fish, the de depletion of our water resources, all those things. And we say, you know, the simplest solution to that is bring back the cause, bring back the fish pond, bring back the, the how would you say, the, the recycled uh, things that were created in the past where these were birthing grounds. We help the minnows survive so they can be released into the ocean so we can spawn more fish. So in other words, sustainable systems. Sustainable systems. Our meetings with the Department of Education, trying to see how we can change the curriculum to get those kids uh, more coming to these kinds of areas that has history, mm -hmm. yeah, but hindered always by insurance policies and things like that. In other words, so, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. yeah. So it's been beneficial for us. In fact, the legislation last week just passed our, um, our Ahamoku bill that now puts together a simple uh, policy on how we would operate. We see it as a bottom to top management. From the bottom up From instead the of the top up down. From the bottom up instead of the top down. Yeah, which makes all the difference, yeah? Oh yes, yeah. and it's uh, most definitely beneficial, especially when you're dealing with a lot of uh, devastation that happened here. You know, like the biggest one was Eau Valley when that river raged. When the floods came. When the floods came. Eau was in the only area that got hit. My valley got hit too. Kaula. Right up there. Wow. And right on the opposite side is Eau and this side is wow. uh, Kaula. Wow. Yeah, Moku, you know, we talked earlier about stepping back in time and the time machine, what this area was like. If you and I came here 100, 200, 300 years from now, what would you like this to look like? I just wanted to come back. Like it was? Yep. And uh, a lot of the community understand why it's important that we got to work together and everything. If you look from Mauka all the way down to the bottom, that whole area right there, that swath of land, yes. that's all Kamehameha Schools. No kidding. Kamehameha Schools owns all that up yep. there. 
So I'm working right now with Kamehameha Schools on how we can, we, we, there's a small pilot project on the bottom, there's a farm, and it's Kahalawai Farms. I've been working with them. We built a kuaho, an offering area for them, just about a couple weeks ago. Because they need to be given a reminder every day that when they pass that kuaho, they're obligated to it, yeah? That everything that they grow on that land, they have to give something to a kua. So hopefully from that, the land will be flourished again. They start growing the trees so the rains come closer. Mm -hmm. You know, the more trees you plant, the more oxygen you have in this area. This area is the old ruins of all sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Now that sugar cane is no longer here, it seems like our lands were abandoned and, you know, the water was diverted. It's still diverted. It was supposed to be diverted for sugar cane cultivation. We have no sugar cane now. Now the water is going to the development that's coming up on the rise over here. Mm. So everything is so topsy-turvy. Mm. So what I really want to see is a viable Ahupua system of what we had. So people start saying that, you know what, Hawaii is the place I want to live. Mm. We have more Hawaiians moving to the mainland because they can't handle it here anymore. Wow, and it should be just the opposite, yeah? It should be, yeah, it should be the opposite. but. You know, I have nothing against a lot of people wanting to live here. Who doesn't want to live in Hawaii, you know? But we have things that we have to take care of in order for we to say that we can take care of our guests that come to live here with us. Mm -hmm. Right now, we can't take care of them. Mm -hmm. And I hope that come tomorrow, everything will be viable and we can, you know, before we never used to lock our cars. We used to, you know, somebody wanted to use my car, they welcome to. We never used to lock our doors at our house. Now today we gotta put up fence lines. Why? To keep people out. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so it's just a division that you know we have a hard time with. But to the Ahamoku Council system, hopefully that we can bring everybody together to infuse traditional resource management with contemporary management by bringing two two of the ideas together, infusing it into one, so we can start going the right direction. And Kamboku, that's what you teach right in here, yeah? Yes, every day. Every day. This is a resource center for land titles. We do a lot of other education. We even have ukulele lessons for the kids after school. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. <laughs> that's great. And so what you're doing here and this building right here is directly tied to Moka'ula right over here. The families are still here. They want to see something happen. I think we're just getting diverted by the politics of what needs to happen first in order for us to accomplish our goals. So the vision is here. It's shared by many, many people. And it just takes time and work to overcome the hurdles to be able to actualize the vision, make it happen, yeah? Yeah, and you know, the, the hardest thing is um, um, commerce. Money getting in the yeah. way. Well, like if you have this place totally in operation, like it may turn into say a Polynesian culture center, you know? You have the island and then, you know, there was a plan saying that, oh, we should have some boats going around so we can do some tours and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We should turn this area into a viable resource by raising the fish so we can start telling the scientists, we got plenty of fish. You don't have to count fish anymore. We're not depleted, yeah? That's the priority that we should be thinking about. Not about turning this place into a Polynesian culture center just because we can bring in money so we can subsidize to make sure that we can handle the maintenance and management of these areas. That's mm. not the way to go. Mm. Our history is at stake. We need to bring our history back. And our history has a lot of lessons that our future generations need to learn on how to take care of Aina. Yeah, I mean, what happened in Moka'ula years and years and years ago and what you're doing here right now in present day are really models for sustainability that can be taught to future generations, not only in Hawaii, but people all over the world, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and we're actually learning from a lot of other people from around the world too. Really? A lot of the indigenous people and the things that they're doing is exactly the same thing we're doing. So wow. We're connected, our EK, our minds. We're starting to get our kids to go to those sites and learning hands-on kind of things is really important on how we know we're going the right direction. Mm -hmm. Getting the people or the kids to 
actually go to those areas. And what's their reaction when they go to those areas and begin to learn this stuff and, and, and get the vision? Very excited. Really? Yeah, they're very excited, especially when I take them to the fish ponds or sometimes when we're working with the canoes out there. They can hardly wait to get in the ocean. <laughs> when I was doing the fish pond project in Kihei, it's sad that you take the kids over there, but because of liabilities and all that, they can't even go in the water and help us carry stones or, wow. you know, even put pebbles in the walls that we build. Mm. So today it's different. Now they can. So we see that there's a progress that is being done to make sure that we infuse the knowledge of yesterday into today's pathetic management. Wow. That's a great message. Thank you for being on Voices of Truth. We got to leave it there, Kamoko Kapu. Please keep doing what you're doing. Mahalo. Don't stop. You're making a difference. Big time. Mahalo. Thank you. And mahalo to our viewers for joining me and Kamoko Kapu here in Lahaina. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24 7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com and you can visit Voices of Truth one on one with Hawaii's future on Facebook. I'm Ehu K. Kahu Cardwell for the Kawani Foundation along with Kamoku here. And until next time, Ahui Ho! Broadcasting Network.